In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus wasn't particularly interested in money for its own sake, although he spoke about it very often, mainly because we are so interested, and if you want to get our attention, well, talk about money, and we are all ears. In getting to grips with this parable, it helps to know what a talent was in his day. Well, we can guess that it was a unit of currency, that the master in the story gave his servants some money to look after, perhaps nothing unusual in that, with trusted retainers. Often when people speak of this gospel, they equate talent with the meaning of the word today and ask what we have done with the gifts and abilities that God has given us. Do we give back to our world? Do we contribute something? Do we repay with interest? As the source of all life, God has given us our life, a mind and a heart to perceive him, the teachings of scripture and the church to seek to understand, at least in part, what he wants of us and the gifts and energy with which we are meant to serve him, chiefly by serving and cherishing each other. Remember that Jesus said, what you do to the least of your brothers and sisters, you do to me. And so on one level, we are asked the question now, what have you done with what you were given? What mark? Are you, we, each one of us, to leave on the world? How have we changed it for good? How have we benefited the lives of those around us? Which servant do we resemble? Are we like the one who buried the money, who shared nothing of what he was given, the one who yielded no surplus, no gain, nothing beyond merely existing? Or have we given back to life generously, abundantly? But there are other layers to this gospel reading as well. We need to know the context, because part of Matthew's motivation was reproachful, combative, the early Christian relationship with local Jewish communities was worsening, and he was in effect accusing his fellow Jews who would not accept Christ as burying their heritage in the ground, preserving it, but at the same time entombing it of burying the treasures of Judaism. Matthew's vehemence shows us the roots of a sad parting between Christians and Jews. But it also shines a light onto us as well. As Christians today, the same challenge may well be issued to us. The faith has been passed on to us to either be preserved in aspic or refreshed and re-enlivened. Do we merely pass on what we have inherited without change, without progression, without yielding new and growing fruits? Do we take what was given to us, a faith that previous generations have cared for and nurtured, they fought for, died for and struggled with, that has adapted over time with each great upsurge of mankind, gained new strength and new life. Do we take this faith so full of energy and promise in the knowledge of the supreme duty that we owe not only to generations past but to infinite numbers of generations to come and then simply let it languish? Honoured and observed on the surface perhaps, repeated and rehearsed by rote, but in reality allowed to drift, to tread water, to atrophy. 
Or do we take our faith and using what gifts and talents we have, using what insights and inspiration we have from our own age, seek to leave it a little better, to pass it on a little healthier, a little wiser, more alive for our having held it in our care. Our modern world has learnt new and important lessons about the place of women in our society, about tolerance towards those who differ from a strict and narrow interpretation of what is normal in their modes of living and of loving. We have learned lessons of science, of philosophy and psychology, unimaginable to those who framed the early tenets of our faith. It is simply not good enough to find that the secular world can often be more tolerant, more accepting, more loving towards people who once were rejected and abused and about whom the church is at best still ambivalent. The Christian faith cannot become simply a museum for past ideas, values and prejudices. Far from lagging behind society, as we do, for example, in our attitude towards people who are gay, we need to be in the forefront of the pursuit of justice, mercy and radical love of our fellow man. We need to lead our society in what it means to be a fully valued, fully loved and fully realised human being. For the true drama of today's gospel story comes from knowing that a talent, or talenton, as it was called in Greek, was the largest unit of currency known to man. As a measure of weight, the talent was equivalent to about 75 pounds, or 35 kilos, of gold. And that's just one talent. So this man who left eight talents with his servants was in today's terms entrusting them with millions and millions of pounds, an unimaginable fortune. So in speaking of such vast and wildly unrealistic sums, Jesus is flagging that he is not so much talking about such mundane things as being hardworking or resourceful, turning a profit, or even about generosity. He is instead speaking of the infinitely greater vision of building God's kingdom on earth, of a world in which justice does not go to the highest bidder, where all people are esteemed, not for what they bring to the party, not for the profit they turn, but for possessing the fullness of human dignity. He is speaking of a time when we do not exploit and corrupt the natural world we have been given, but care for it, nurture it, nourish it, live in harmony with it. In using the analogy of the talents, he is speaking of things of infinite value. And conversely, when as a church we speak of sin, we need to reassure people that we are not obsessing about whether they swear a bit, like a drink and a night out with friends, or who they have sex with, and who they love and wish to marry, but that we are much more concerned about who they, we, do not love as we should, those who we do not care for, those whom we do not cherish and honour. And that might also include ourselves. Jesus uses the illustration about money because sadly, all too often, that is what is dear to us, what we as individuals and society actually cherish. When in fact, what should be of immeasurably greater value to us are the people around us, whether they be family, friend or even stranger. The sins that we commit are the wounds, great or small, that we inflict on each other and consequently also 
upon ourselves. As Christians, we are not called to be curators, and our faith is not to be locked in a museum. Our faith is not a refuge or a hiding place or simply a port in a storm, but a source of challenge, of renewed energy, and the courage to imagine and to create a better world. Our faith must live and grow and change and prosper. We must leave our world and our faith a little better for them having passed through our hands. For one day too, we will be asked to give an account of what kind of stewards we have been. Amen.